Mm, yes. Mm. <laughs> Live we come to you, yes. Mm. From the Green Dragon, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is our lead in. My fighting Uruk Hai. Hello, I'm Nicholas John. And I am Nick Andrew. And we come to you live from the Green Dragon. In this episode of our prologue series, we conclude our look at the peoples of Middle-earth. This time we're going to talk about orcs, goblins, trolls, and wraiths. Wraiths. Yeah. Oh, that's creepy. Getting into the uglies, the bad guys. Mom. (laughs) Orcs. Yeah. I don't know of a soul on the planet that has interacted with fantasy anything that does not know what the word orc is. Let us tell you the origin of the orc. That was dramatic, wasn't it? I like that. It was good. So orcs. Yurks. Uruks. Goblins. Synonymous with each other. The orc does not start as one would expect. And no, we're not talking about Thrall, the war chief of the Horde. And no, we're not talking about the Warhammer 40k orcs in space marine suits. We're talking about orcs. Beings of destruction. Writhing, horrible things. Believe it or not, my friends, orcs, to quote the late, the great, Sir Christopher Lee, were elves once. Taken by the dark powers, tortured and mutilated, a ruined and terrible form of life. Yes, they were elves. We know from 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 kind of the, the, the various sources of Tolkien's work that Melkor, later referred to as Morgoth, the first Dark Lord of this world took elves, the first children of Iluvatar. He took them and he used his powers and he twisted and tortured and warped elves, the tall, proud, beautiful race that we talked about two episodes ago. He twisted them into the orcs that we know, we love, and we love to hate. This becomes a theme with a lot of the bad guys, this this twisted nature, um... Melkor, Morgoth, Sauron, they see the good things in the world and they hate them and they try to twist them into uh, a creature of their own making, but neither of them has the ability to create life. Um, So they can't create their own race of their own power. All they can do is corrupt, uh, denigrate, and twist what is already there. So the orcs are kind of the, the ubiquitous version of, of this terror, but it's not the only thing as we'll talk about later. Right. Like you, you bring up uh, corruption, twisting Sauron and his master Morgoth or Melkor. They have no ability to create and they twist. And I mean, that's, that's a common theme. We see that a lot. We're going to talk about that concept a lot in this episode as we, we dive into orcs, goblins, trolls, and wraiths. Um, but orcs, I think, are particularly tragic because it's the elves. These are the first children of Iluvatar. This is what the universe itself has been waiting for, counting the days. In the last episode, we talked about the dwarves and Aule, the Valar not being able to contain his excitement and creating something of his own because he can't bear to wait anymore. That reminds me of me waiting for the return of the king when I was a teenager. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he couldn't wait. It's true. And now we, now we have that faded moment in history when the elves are born. And, and Melkor, the greatest of the Valar, twists them into the orcs. And I mean, if, you, if you've seen any of the films, if you've read the books, the, the, the description of orcs is gross. And they're, they're nasty. I mean, I don't know. I, <laughs> they better have damn good dental insurance, let me tell you that. But they're, they're gross. They are, I mean, they are 
And this, I think, just becomes part of that fall, that separation from their original form, is they are as ugly as the elves are fair. And and I think that happens that happens a lot. In, in a little bit, we'll talk about trolls, and the the theory is that they come they they're a twisted form of another race, and they are they're a broken version of that other race. And I I, I don't want to get there unless we're we're not done with orcs yet. So that that that's just that becomes a theme on on what what happens here. Well, and, and just like the, the elves are varied, you know, you talk about the Sylvan elves and you talk about the Noldor elves and wood elves and high elves, if you want to use, you know, stereotypical terms. Um, orcs are really uh, just as diverse. Um, earlier on, I, I mentioned four different words, Yerk, Orc, Uruk, and Goblin, and they're all synonymous. Uh, Yerk is the, the elf term for an orc, the elf, elven word. Uh, orc is the common tongue word. Uruk is just another another word for orc. And then we've got goblin. Some of you may be going and say, what? I said this last episode. I'll say it again. Goblins and orcs are the same race. No, say it isn't so. Come on, Nick. You can't be you can't be serious. Them goblins be the same, bruh. Goblins typically the, the term goblin is used for an orc that is subterranean. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna look, if I were to go and live in a cave for ten years and then come out of the cave, I'd look pretty different than the way I look now. Probably wouldn't have much hair. I'd be really pale. And I probably would have lost a lot of weight, because last time I checked, they don't store cupcakes in caves. Except except in hobbit holes. But those aren't caves. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> Caves are filled with oozy smells. Hobbit holes are very clearly depicted as not containing oozy smells. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. I'd, I'd look a little different. Goblins are orcs that are primarily subterranean. We encounter goblins specifically in the Misty Mountains. In the Hobbit narrative, we encounter goblin town. We meet the great goblin, big fat goblin. I love the portrayal in the Hobbit films. Judge me later. Um, and then we have the goblins that we see in the Lord of the Rings in the, in the Fellowship of the Ring, where they're kind of climbing down like spiders and it's really creepy and they look really lanky and they've got big eyes. I mean, imagine being a goblin, so an orc, that is the child of the child of the child of the child of a person that has lived underground their entire life. You're going to look different. Now, uh, let me let me tangent us slightly. Is this the reason Gollum looks the way he does? He hides from the sun and the moon underground for hundreds of years. Um, it's got to be part of it, right? Well, I mean, let's compare it with what what other example we've got. We've got Bilbo Baggins, who had the ring for fifty years. Really, fifty five years? I can't remember. Um. He didn't look... 60. 60 years. 60? How yeah. old was he in The Hobbit? I thought he was 50. Yeah, and at 111, he gave it up. You're right. 111. It's not 111, Nick. It's 111. I stand corrected. I give that number at work. If someone has a bill that is a total of $111, I tell them their balance is 111. I have never been corrected. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I believe you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I broke myself. Oh. Uh, let's compare it to who else we've got. We've got Bilbo. He had the ring for 60 years. Take give or take a couple. He didn't look super gaunt. He didn't look subterranean. He didn't have massive eyes. He wasn't losing his hair. Gandalf says you haven't aged a day. Granted, we're talking sixty years versus a couple hundred years. Really, I, I would, I would say Gollum's appearance is largely attributed to his subterranean lifestyle. It's interesting. I never put those two things together, um, but I, I think I agree with you. Hmm. I think. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's just so, interesting. It's, I mean, the last couple of episodes we've given each other something to think about, and and that's that's one of those things where I've not 
I've I've known the the connection orcs and goblins they're the same, but the reasons like I've never stopped to think about why there's this physical difference. Um, but this all makes it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you know, go to the ocean deep deep part of the ocean and everything looks way different than it does at the surface it, it, there's there's reasons so and i mean a, a shark doesn't become a gulper eel because it swims down to the the deepest depths of the ocean it's still a shark so uh, i mean if if an orc were to run into the mines of moria it doesn't instantly make them a goblin but i'm saying like the goblins that we encounter are like i said are children of children of children of children of orcs that have been underground their entire life they're going to look different. So naturally, there's a word to depict that. But you get to the core of it, and orcs and goblins are the same thing. Agreed. I'm done. My tangent is through. I apologize for my passions. Now, you, you did mention uruks. Mm. And uruks are another physical difference. You know, like, there is a there is the separation in understanding when you talk about um, uruks versus goblins versus orcs in the general um the uruks are like they're the the beefed out macho hero orcs right i am to orc as dwayne johnson is to uruk (laughs) if you could see nick uh well both of us um (laughs) uh, you would agree (laughs) so yeah the uruks are are like the fighter they're like I said, the hero orcs. They're the the big ones, the tall ones, the ones that will that can carry the heaviest weapons and do the most damage. Orcs, in the way the story unfolds, seem to be best in numbers. So they'll they'll overwhelm you with numbers uh, because their stature is such that they need the numbers to be victorious. However, orcs can stand toe to toe with humans with the race of men or the or the elves and hold their own right they're right as tall as men they're as strong as men or nearly um and in the movies most of the armies that we encounter are made up of uruks yes is there a difference with the uruk high which are kind of a big deal in the movies and even even in the books the uruk high specifically seem to come from orthanc thanks to saruman right Technically speaking, the Uruk Hai and and the Uruks like we were just talking about are the same thing. Um, In the movie, the term Uruk Hai, I think, was used as a mechanic to differentiate uh, what Saruman was kind of sending from Isengard or or Orthanc. And really, they're they're largely the same. If you want to look to the Hobbit films, um, Azog, his stature... Will will I honestly? I would say that's a good cookie cutter for an uruk or an uruk high, and I think if you're if you're drawing from the films, uruk high is a term used to differentiate the the uruks that come from Isengard. But an uruk is an uruk, being uruk high or just plain old uruk, and something that really further not not only just stature, capability, and um, strength that differentiates an uruk from just a typical orc is daylight yes yeah orcs are notorious uh notoriously known for not being able to uh withstand the daylight very well they will shy away from it the orcs the goblins of moria won't venture out until nightfall right and there i'll I'll throw right back to the fact that moria is filled with orcs that have been they're goblins right i mean they're they're subterranean they don't handle light you stand in a cave for your whole life and then try and run out into the sun (laughs) it's gonna hurt right Exactly. Even the moonlight would hurt at that point. So them venturing out at all is really a feat of of strength on their part. Right. You can see this difference in in daylight most prominently with the Urukai who leave Orthanc and attack Helm's Deep, and what happens over in Gondor with with um, the the cloud cover, the darkness, the darkness of Mordor that spreads over the land. Saruman sends his army out, you know, day or night. They just go. They run day and night. It doesn't bother them. Um, they attack Helm's Deep. It doesn't matter if it's day or night. But in Mordor, 
because there's probably a mixture in the army, Sauron sends out a cloud and covers the world and, you know, blots out the sun, basically, um, so that his army can march. So this is one of the major differences that you see with the Uruks and the regular orcs. Exactly. Exactly right. So, and, and the, the army that attacks Minas Tirith, the Witch King's army, largely. Same concept. It'd be a mix. We've got trolls in that army. We've got orcs. We've got uruks. And Sauron was known for this concept of, of belching smog out. I mean, that's... <laughs> come on. You've got a volcano in your arsenal? You've got Mount Doom? We gonna belch some smog, man. We gonna belch some smog. You've mentioned both of the other two races we want to talk about. Let's let's wait for on the wraiths, and we'll get to them. Uh, let's talk about trolls really quickly, because I don't know that we know a lot about the trolls. It's theorized that they are a twisted version of Ents. Right. Treebeard is actually the one that gives us that little nugget. There's a point in the narrative where he suggests... The, the, quote, Dark Lord, end quote, created the trolls to resemble Ents. Or really, you want to look at it practically to counter Ents. Because we mentioned before the concept that Morgoth, Melkor, Sauron's master, the first Dark Lord, they can't create. So they like to take what has been created and twist it. And whether you're talking the concept of mortality and twisting it into a fear of death, or you're talking elves and twisting it into orcs, you take Ents which were created to safeguard the forests, and you twist them into trolls. And like you mentioned, we don't really have too much with trolls. We've got trolls that can talk, like the trio from The Hobbit, and then we've got trolls like the cave troll in Moria that grunt and growl and roar. I mean, we've got, we've got cave trolls mentioned, we've got hill trolls, we've got mountain trolls, snow trolls, stone trolls, and quote-unquote Olug High. Olug High are largely seen, like, in the Third Age, they take part in the War of the Ring. And just like Uruk High, Olug High, daylight doesn't affect them. They don't care. They don't give a crap if the sun is up. They will still smash skulls. So in the movie, they're the the trolls that are on Pelennor Field moving around those big war machines. Right. right. I mean, that's probably the best assumption. Like these, these are the, the best of the best of the best of the trolls that just don't care about the sunlight. If you've seen the Battle of the Five Armies, the trolls that participate in that battle would largely have been all look high, given the fact that war, no one knows how long the big battles are going to take. The last thing you want is your army skimping out the minute the sun comes up. So if you're talking the Battle of the Five Armies, which took place for a long time, all look high. If you're talking the Battle of Pelennor Field, even though Sauron belched that smog out of Mount Doom, when the Rohirrim come in, we know for a fact that the sun came up. That's, that's given to us. That information is given to us. So you would imagine that the trolls that took part during that battle wouldn't have been affected by the sun coming up. So all are high is the assumption. That's interesting because the most direct contact... Well, you mentioned trolls that can speak. And the most direct contact we have with trolls that can speak is in The Hobbit when, when the unfortunate dwarves get kind of captured and they they argue about how they're going to cook them what a load of rubbish i've eaten plenty with their skins on scoffer might say boots and all he's right nothing wrong with a bit of raw dwarf and thanks to gandalf they they make it out alive but you know they're very very worse for wear um so they are kind of the epitome of the broken version of trolls um they can speak they have their own lives that they live they have all all of the things that a race needs but they can't survive the daylight so they have to hide they i mean versus an ent who is a tree thing and sunlight is the thing that makes trees grow so they have this direct incompatibility with each other right it's like an antithesis almost destructive and killed by sun compared to constructive because an end's purpose is to shepherd the forest we have a constructive and sustained by the sun so really i mean we're almost talking a direct antithesis 
I mean, and and we're not really, we really aren't given much more than that as far as trolls are concerned. We're constantly thrown different types of trolls, like I mentioned. In the wider fantasy world, trolls are more like cave trolls. Am I right? I, I suppose. And you look at trolls, I don't know too much about Warhammer. Um, but you look at trolls in some of like Dungeons and Dragons, etc., and we're looking at cave trolls. And then you look at you look at something that is 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 widespread and well known as Warcraft, and we're looking at trolls like like lanky, oh, of course, big lanky voodoo, of course, yeah, Jamaican accents like you be German, man. I mean, it's it's very. I mean, I think the most recent Warcraft expansion, their war chief. Of the Horde, which is an entire faction of people, is a troll, and he dies right in the beginning. So uh, trolls, trolls have kind of varied a lot. I mean, we talked, we've talked extensively about how Tolkien set the paradigm for dwarves and set the paradigm for elves, and created orcs. There's no dispute there. Tolkien created orcs. Let that ring for a second. He created orcs, and then trolls. There's so many different versions of trolls. Same with goblins. So many different versions of goblins. Tolkien's goblins just so happen to be subterranean orcs. Warcraft goblins just so happen to be peddling Ferengi. <laughs> For those of you who are Star Trek fans. <laughs> I broke you again. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Time is money, friend. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Whew. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I forgot about the Warcraft trolls, and they're definitely different from the trolls that we meet in Lord of the Rings or in Middle Earth. You know, that's an example of, of the wider fantasy world taking liberty with a thing that is part of mythology and and largely made up. So we have one more item on our list of the peoples of Middle Earth. Before we move on to our next topic in our prologue series, and this is one of the major one of the major bad guys of of our story these These are the creatures that above any others will instill nightmares in the unassuming unassuming relatively speaking and unassuming unrelatively speaking <laughs> wraiths the wraiths yes. I want you to sit, all of you, I want you to sit back for a second and think of the term wraith. What does it mean? What, what, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a wraith? Like, l- literally, take a second. Are you thinking like ghost? Or spirit? Or specter? Kind of on the right path. Writhing. Right? Writhing. I like that. I've never connected that. Writhing. Almost sounds like a wreath, which is a twisted thing. Stop it! Oh my gosh. Mind blown. Okay, wraiths. We encounter wraiths in the Lord of the Rings narrative. And I can talk all I want about other things, but the wraiths, ring wraiths, are prominent. So, you know the poem. Three rings from the elven kings under the sky. Seven for the dwarf lords in their halls of stone. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. One for the dark lord in his dark throne. In the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. One ring to rule them all. One ring to find them. One ring to bring them all. And in the darkness bind them. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows shadows lie. So we know of the three. We've talked about the three. We didn't really talk about the seven. And albeit the seven, there's not really that much to tell. What do we know about the seven? Let's just go over that really quickly. They were either reclaimed or were they all destroyed in Dragonfire? I mean, really, it's kind of a toss-up. We know Sauron has some of them. We know Sauron lost some of them. Um, we know, dispute this if you will, we know that Thoror, king out into the mountain, Thorin's grandfather. It was Thorin, son of Thrain, son of Thoror. Yes, Thoror. Um, wow, I think of that like Klingon fashion. Thoror, king under the mountain, insane greed for gold, 
amassed one of, if not the greatest fortune in the history of Middle Earth that was so great that it attracted Smaug, the, 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 the great calamity of the third age, as it were. It's seriously heavily implied that the ring that Thror had, one of the seven, instigated that greed or that quote unquote dragon sickness. Now, we do know from the appendices that a wraith, a ring wraith, we don't know which, was sent. Let me rephrase that. An emissary of Mordor was sent. Now, if it were me running Mordor, I'd send a wraith, but hmm, was sent to the Lonely Mountain to barter and to try and, and was rejected. Um, so it's, we know Thor had a ring. We know Thrain inherited the ring, and we know Thrain lost the ring. Logic dictates, and Spock approves, that Sauron got the ring. That's one of the seven. That the one ring was created to control. So if Sauron got that back, that's kind of not a good thing. But then we have the nine. Nine for mortal men doomed to die. And if you've watched the films, Kate Blanchett as Galadriel's beautiful intro kind of rephrases that as nine were gifted to the race of men who above all else, and her voice takes a beautifully negative inflection, desire power. Nine. Well, there happen to be nine ring wraiths. Is that where you're going with this? We have nine of the most fearsome creatures in Middle Earth. We don't know the origins of a lot of them. At all. We can suspect that they're black Numenorians. Now, you may think I'm being racist, and I'm not, and I really want to clarify this. A black Numenorian is a Numenorian. Now, we talked about Numenorians in the last episode. We talked about men and dwarves. Numenorians, to quote Sauron's perception, were great and terrible to behold. A black Numenorian is a Numenorian that Sauron managed to twist to serve him. This was something he was afraid of that he twisted to serve him. I want that, I really want that to sink in. Because there are several of Sauron's key servants that were led to believe are black Numenorians. And the black doesn't have anything to do with the color of their skin. It has to do with the content of their heart. We'll say that. The Witch King of Angmar, who is the leader of the Nine Wraiths, the Nine Ring Wraiths, is, we are led to believe, was a black Numenorean sorcerer. Sauron just so happens to be, quote, the greatest sorcerer in the history of the world, end quote. The Witch King's right hand, Kamul, comes from east or south, or both, out of Middle-earth. We know nothing about this guy, except the fact that he's terrifying and damn good enough to be the Witch King's right hand. The mouth of Sauron, not a wraith, but worth mentioning at the moment, we meet him in The Return of the King, book and film, extended film, sorry, was also a black Numenorean, twisted to be the mouthpiece, the literal mouthpiece of Sauron. Mm. We don't know much about the rest of the ring rates, but we do have enough evidence to name Ermurazor, the Pale King, the Witch King of Angmar, and, and Kamul, his right hand, and then the mouth of Sauron, who's not a wraith, but again, I'm mentioning him because of Black Numenorians. The rest of the wraiths were lords, kings, perhaps, stewards, I don't know. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I think that we're sort of led to believe that they were definitely high-ranking, um, possibly all kings from, from various places. They don't have to come from Middle-earth. They don't have to be Gondorians or Rohirrim or anything like that, because there's plenty of men in the East. Right. Um, and and uh, we know that Sauron um, has his base camp basically is in the east and Mordor is his front door um, uh, to Gondor and the rest of Middle Earth. We we do know about the wraiths is that they appear invisible, that they're cloaked in black and they ride black horses but as 
as in the uh, the Ford of Bruinen, they're decloaked and they have to go and find shelter or be re-robed or find new steeds or all three because they can't they're not effective if they're not scary you you that that's that's brilliant that's a brilliant segue because one of the most prominent impacts of the presence of a ring wraith more properly referenced as nazgul we have nazg which is ring and we have ghoul which is wraith nazgul and like the the the, the poem Ashnazg Durbatuluk Ashnaz Gimbutu Ashnazg Sarakatuluk Agbur Zamishi Krim Patul Nazg is ring. Nazgul ring wraith. That was that was the poem from earlier in Black Speech. F Y I. Oh, one of their prominent impacts is fear. Uh, one one of the things that they do that we're led, uh, like we're, we're given the impression of, is they have this shriek, this like bone chilling shriek. Beautifully depicted in the films. Thank you, Fran Walsh, who dodges the media left and right, but had the balls to shriek into the sound recording mic for us. Um, beautifully depicted in the films. Uh, but that shriek and they, their, their mere presence gives one a complete lack of hope, a void of hope and positivity and happiness is just all sucked away. Those of you that have read Harry Potter think the effect of the Dementor. They're the closest thing in literature to a ring wraith that I can think of. Right. With their, with their sort of like aura of depression that goes out from them. I would even say despair. Despair is a better word. Just complete despair. Like there is no hope left in the world. All you want to do is run. That's kind of the, the the feeling and the aura of the ring wraiths. And that's something that our our primary narrative characters have to deal with the entire time they're in their presence. And it's beautiful in the Return of the King. And I won't name names, but there is an antithesis to that that appears and that comes about and that helps fight that in a very critical moment in a very critical place. And it makes me happy as a panda. <laughs> Also worth mentioning with the wraiths is, um, like, we focused on the ring wraiths, the Nazgul. Wraith, the term wraith is used and seems to be largely accepted in Middle Earth. And while we focus on the ring wraiths, we being us and the narrative itself, we're, we're very much led to believe that r the concept of wraiths is relatively common. If not common, at least known. Um, it could be common in the sense of, of fairy tale, mm -hmm. um, you know, where we have um, in our own in our own place and time we have characters like Hansel and Gretel or Adam and Eve, where we don't know them. Sometimes their their existence is disputed. Like I don't know that anyone really expects Hansel and Gretel to be real, but. But they are common characters who come up. They could be fairy tale characters to scare right. children into behaving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're not wrong. I really hope that we've done enough justice to the wraiths now and we don't overstep <laughs> when we get to the narrative because we're going to encounter them quite a lot. So I think this is a good place to, to wrap up where we are. And uh, I would like to thank you for joining us for episode five of our prologue series on the Green Dragon Live podcast. Oh, yes. And believe me when I tell you there's so much more to come. Uh, please visit our website, uh, greendragonlive.com where you will find out all about this show. You can also subscribe to our newsletter where you get show notes and everything else. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, if you're into the Twitters, at Green Dragon Live, and shoot us your questions and comments and anything else, any thoughts, using the hashtag GDLive. Or you can visit our page on Facebook at facebook.com slash Green Dragon Live. I do also want to take a second to shout out to our friend Harry Morell for our beautiful intro and outro music. I encourage you, look him up on YouTube to find more of his work at youtube.com slash Harry Morell. That's Morell with two R's and two L's. Thanks again for listening. I'm Nicholas John. And I am Nick Andrew. Join us next time when we are live from the Green Dragon. Remember... The road goes ever on and on. And if you don't keep your feet, there's no knowing where you might get swept off to. Mm -hmm.